G'day folks, and thanks for joining us. Tonight we catch up with the human broomstick, Kay Bush, and we take a look at the trout at Lake Jindabyne in New South Wales snowy mountains. This looks all right here, Bushy. How long would it be since it's been up this high? Probably quite a few years. It'll be, uh... Yeah, it looks all right, man. I tell you what. Oh. You're sneaking around there. Tell you what, confidence is a lot in fishing, and it looks all right today, eh? Looks good. Folks, you know, I've been fishing for nigh on 40 years and I always get that feeling. It's the feeling of anticipation. I've got the human broom with me, Bushy. This is your home territory, mate. Jindabyne often plays second fiddle to its more famous brother, Lake Eukenbeen, because Eukenbeen probably made its name in the 60s and 70s as the absolute mecca of trout fishing on the mainland of Australia. Yes, Rex, but it's a bit underrated, I think, Jindabyne. It's, uh, it's a much better lake than people think especially when the water's high like this, because it doesn't happen all that often. Well, there's a little bit of chop on the water and the boats can wait for another day. We really don't need to take any risks up here. It's pretty brisk and we're dressed accordingly. And we hope behind us uh, that flooded area, well, we hope there's a trout for us, Bushy. I've got some nice Melbourne worms. What do you think? I think we're going to kill them, Rex. 50 cents each way, folks, because with the broom, we're always in with a chance. Have a look at the way this vegetation's starting to rot with the new water coming up. Oh, it's fantastic seeing it up this high, Rex, yeah. after all this time. I tell you, I reckon it's uh, up beyond the realm of the possibility to see a tailing fish in here. For... No, you'd expect them to be in here mopping up some of this stuff, the flooded food. Head down, backside up, you know? Yeah, sure. You'd I tell you that. what, you, you talk about challenges, these little bulrushes. Well, that's the sport of fishing, isn't it? People just sort think... us right out. <laughs> This looks all right over here. It's a little bit more open ground over here, away from the rushes, and we've got a bit of a chance to get one if we get one on. Yeah, that's the spot. That is the spot right there. I reckon paying attention to detail, folks, is very, very important in fishing. It really means a lot at the end of the day. Now, I've got a rig out there with a worm and a running sinker, and I don't know what's going on. A few yabbies in the impoundment might have been nipping away at the ends. So I like to check that I've always got a good bait working for me. Now, behind me, you can see there's a lot of vege vegetation. It's very dense. It's very, very rough all these rushes and thistles sticking up, and it's the same under the water because it's just flooded up here in the last few weeks. So if I was just to retrieve normally, she'd be all over Red Rover as far as the hook and sink is concerned. So what I do is I lift very, very quickly, like that, and lift the bait and the rig off the, off the bottom of the lake and wind as quickly as I can and put the rod directly above my head. That's where the advantage of the long rods come in, and you find that you can bring in a rig and check it. In this case, there's a little bit of weed, a few nips on the end, a little bit of weed over the sinker. But because I always like to have the perfect outfit out there working for me, I'm going to clean it up a bit. Now, the bait's the most important thing. Just like a lure, folks, that's what the fish see. And that's what attracts them to your area. I like to look after my bait, and worms are no different. And they're hard to get, particularly in the middle of summer when they're all down about 500 mile under the surface. Now, they've got to be moist, not wet. I use some old face washes that Lynn's thrown out in the old laundry basket. I hope she threw them out because if she hasn't, I'm in trouble. A bit of peat moss, which is readily available from around the nursery areas. You might uh, line your hanging basket with it or mulch it. But it's a perfect mulch for a big box of worms. And just some nice, rich soil that I've mixed in with some vegetable matter. And have a look at them. They're absolutely magnificent, those worms. Now, the secret is to give the trout something to look at. And I like to put two or three of these, but these are genuine snakes, folks. So we only put, say, probably a nice big one and then 
a little one. So it's a pop of worm and a baby worm on the end. And that to me is just an absolute fantastic bait. I'm gonna cast it out and see if we can get a fish. I like to cast a long way out. Just get out well and truly past this type of vegetation. So I use a pretty heavy sinker, but it doesn't matter, it's running, so the fish won't feel a thing. Stop the rig when it hits the water and just place it into the rod holder and just take up the slack slightly. And that is really at 90 degrees to where you're fishing. It's nice and low out of the wind. And these rod holders, I think a pensioner might have sort of invented it. And good on you, mate, whoever you are. Very, very good. Bushy, you're on. Oh, he's gone around a stick, Rex. Oh, gee, he's gee. a big thumper too. Is he? Oh, he's caught around the stick. It's no good being with the fish, ain't it? So we could have fished on that bank where there's no vegetation, folks. And yibbity yibbity, there's no fish. So you've got to get in well, here I've with the fish. I've still got him, but he's wrapped up around a stick. Well, Bushy, it's minus three degrees. What about going for a dip? Well, looks like we might have to. Folks, you've got to understand, this is summer, but it's minus three degrees this morning. My fingers are like, well, you know what? And there's Bushy. Have a look at him. He's a marvellous man. I tell you what, we've got the radio mic off him. And he is desperate to get this fish that he's taken his rod at a million miles an hour. Now, that is very keen, folks. I'm telling you, there's snow on them there hills, and it's absolutely freezing. You are an idiot. How are you going? Look at that. <laughs> oh, that's my God. <laughs> Woo! Look at that. <laughs> Well, come and bring us, give us a look at him. We have a fish. Now, tell you what, folks. <laughs> Bushy said that he was very, very keen to join the company. I think after this, he might own the company. The man that runs the show is the show. Have a look at this. Is he a brown or a rainbow, Bushy? He's a nice brown, Rex, but I've just had to cut the line, so he's free at the moment. If yeah. he leaps out of my hands, we're, we're gone, but we'll bring him in. He's in pretty good nick. Yes, he's a nice fish. He's in good nick. How are you? Uh, I'm in less good nick than he is, Rex. Is it cold? No, it's not cold in the snowy mountains, Rex. <laughs> You're a very, very keen angler to bring that into us. Isn't that marvellous? I, I tell you what, he loved that bunch of worms, mate. You better give him a kiss. No, I tell you what, he's a magnificent fish. I'll give you a kiss, mate. I tell you what, a beautiful male fish. Probably... Well, I reckon you're getting up to a kilo and a half of beautiful gingerbine brown trout. Perfectly formed. Will we let him swim free, Rex? Of course he is, mate. I'll tell you what, he'll oh, absolutely love life. that. It's the best way when they're obviously not going to go first off for the young people. It's just to get their balance, do you think? Yes, yeah, so you just leave them in the water, just wrap him around, don't squeeze him too hard. And uh, he should swim off. Just give him a little bit of a rest. Just work him so that the water goes through his gills. Yeah. And the hook okay. you've left in him, he should be I've able to get that. I've left the hook in him. Yeah. Oh, yeah, look. He swum. Beautiful. And there he goes down there. Now, that is a desperate effort. I'll tell you what. Congratulations, son. Well, he's won me, Bushy. <laughs> I'm certainly not going to do it myself. <laughs> they say this is Rex Hunt Fishing Adventures. <laughs> it's more like one flew over the cuckoo's nest. You idiot. You do have to be crazy. He is. <laughs> Unbelievable! I've got drowned, but you have to uh, you have to have a shot at it when you've got something on there. I don't like to see it get away, as you can see. And now I can show you a little known technique that's not commonly practiced by anglers uh, for emptying waders. It's a terrific technique for the snowy mountains when it's about two degrees. bunch of worms. Didn't love that bunch of worms. Oh, what a good fish. A beautiful brown. Oh, folks, I tell you what, I never ever tire of this. Now, 
At home, a lot of you will say, oh, gee, how's he going to get this in? A lot of you do carry a net. But to be quite truthful, I don't want to be blunt or rude, I reckon sometimes a net can be just a little bit of a disadvantage because you start swishing around with it, and yoo wagons ho. I reckon the easiest way is to beat your fish. Now, he's not going to go anywhere. I've got six-pound line. He's just giving his last little bit of a go, but he's a nice fish. He's not far under a kilo. He scoffed that bunch of worms like there's no tomorrow. And really, I'm going to let him go, but I wish I could talk trout language. But I'll just show you that it'd be quite easy to just play that fish out. The rod's doing all of the work. It's acting like a giant shock absorber. And you see, they're the problems that you've got, but you can control it completely with one of these longer rods. And that's why I always use longer rods. A beautiful little fish, a beautiful little male. Look at the spots in that golden body. And the best way is, is to just keep his head out of the water and you can just beat him like that. Just like that, and the fish is yours. Now that's a beautiful kilo fish. I just wet my hands. Have a look for the hook. No, she's, uh, she's far too far down there. So the hook's, at, uh, the hook's still in him. The line's gone. He'll get rid of that hook in a day or two. It's only very, very sort of minor uh, bronze hook. And we'll just let him go just like that. And didn't he go at 100 miles an hour? So there you are, folks. Bushy, I tell you what, what a unique way it was of getting rid of the water. But Lake Jindabyne, folks, it's not bad at the foot of the snowy mountains. And if you call in, it's certainly worth a try. Look at that, a beautiful mud crab, fresh from tropical waters, and he's going to be absolutely delicious. But catching him's only half the problem. I then have to look after him until I can catch enough of his mates to make a meal. Now, he can inflict a nasty wound on me with those powerful claws, and also, if I put him in a fish box with a few of his mates, they'll tear each other to pieces because they're a very territorial animal. So the best thing to do is to tie mud crabs up. Now, to do that, I'll need about 70 or 80 centimetres of stout cord. I'm just using some of this green packing twine. Then I put the crab on the ground and hold him down with my foot. All good Queensland crab tyres use bare feet, and most of them have still got all their toes, so it must work. Now, it's just a matter of finding the middle of the cord and taking it under what would be the crab's chin, if he had a chin, and then around behind these two big powerful arms with the claws on the end, and into his wrists, if you like. And pull the claws back hard against his body, you can see I've already immobilised them. And then I take them under his back flippers or swimming legs. And at this point, I lift him up, spin him around, and using my toe to hold the middle of the cord, just tie a couple of double granny knots. Nothing very flash about it. Another one to finish off. And as you can see, he's now perfectly safe. I can put him in a box with any number of other crabs. They won't hurt each other. I can pick them up from just about any angle and not get bitten. And when it comes time to cook him, I'm going to put him and his mates in a fridge, or better still, in a freezer, for about an hour, and it'll slow his metabolic rate right down, and then I can cook him humanely and dish up a delightful meal of mud crab. So learn how to tie him up, and you won't have any more problems. Next week on Rex Hunt Fishing Adventures, we meet American ventriloquist David Strasman, and together we fish from the banks of Melbourne's Yarra River. And Steve, Starling and Bushy head north to remote Cape York in far north Queensland. Well, folks, that's just about yibbity yibbit of time. We'll see you next week in the wonderful world of fishing, and in the meantime, hope you catch a big one.